I have quite a few climbers on this frame here. It's partially purchased, but also partially DIY. We've had some really fierce storms come in here and Josh helped me to put these big posts in just to make sure that this entire thing of beans and a chocha doesn't go over. A chocha is a South American vegetable and they look fierce, really fierce. They've got these spikes on them that look dangerous, but they're actually velvety soft. And they taste like a combination of a sweet bell pepper and cucumber, and you can use them as such. They're also really easy to grow in a temperate climate. You don't have to put them under cover, and if you give them some place to romp away, they will happily reward you with some really reliable crops. It's the garden in August, and it is an absolutely beautiful day. The sun is out, it's quite calm, and it is a perfect day to go have a full look at the garden, see what we've been up to, and harvest some veg. Before we get to too much more veg and before we look inside the polycrop, I just want to show you this. The wildflower bank, it is absolutely blooming and there are bees all over these flowers. There are quite a few flowers that I can name, quite a few that I don't know, but altogether they are creating just this beautiful blooming border that makes me smile every single time I look at it and I know it's helping all of the insects and wildlife that visit my garden. And those same insects, those same pollinators are helping to pollinate crops and just make my garden a much more diverse and living space. Isn't this stunning? Let me know what you think of it. Somewhere in this mass are tons of courgettes. I've been trying to keep on top of them. You can see there's some little guys here, but our fridge is absolutely choco with these. Oh gosh, there's more over here. You guys know the feeling too many zucchini to really know what to do with. And this is just three plants. Oh my goodness. Down here, the leeks are doing good, but you can see all of those green plants in between them. That's spinach and it's self-seeded spinach because I had some spinach that I let go to seed on the far end earlier this year. And I left it because I thought, oh, we could get a good crop off of them, but they just went straight to seed. And then down here underneath the mesh, the veggie mesh, I've got loads of carrots. I'm going to leave these to continue growing, but we'll take some carrots out of the veggie pod in a little bit. If you're wondering about this mesh, it is a really fine mesh. I get it from Gardening Naturally. I'll have a link down in the video description if you're interested in getting the same stuff. And the hoops are from them too. And the reason I have my carrots covered is to protect the carrots from something called carrot root fly. And it lays its eggs at the base of plants, of carrots. And then the babies, AKA the maggots, burrow into the carrots and basically riddle them with holes and make them pretty much inedible but by putting the mesh over them, it protects these carrots and they can grow happily and healthily under here and I can get a good harvest later on. Let's put this back on. We don't want any flies getting in there. For most of this year, this lower bed was filled with cabbages and I've harvested them all and I've planted some autumn peas. This is a variety called terrain it's mildew resistant and as you can see I got them started early and I again grew them in a gutter and then just a few days ago I planted them out, slid them right out of the gutter and into a trench, gave them the same sticks that the sugar end peas were growing on earlier this year and then I found that those metal hoops do a really good job of keeping it all constrained so I've put those on either side as well. Even though the main crop potato patch was only a couple of rows long, it was very weedy and so I decided to go through it by hand. But by the end, I had this entire crate of King Edward main crop potatoes. And I also have a good handful 
of purple main crop potatoes. These are all storage potatoes, and so what I'll do next is dry them out someplace in the sun with lots of air around them just for a day or so. We don't want them turning any more green than they already are. Some of them are slightly touched. And that was my fault because the patch was very weedy and I had not earthed up the potatoes, which is a big no-no. So I had quite a few green potatoes, quite a few tiny, tiny little potatoes at the top. And although the foliage looked like it was all natural die-off, Actually, there was a bit of blight in the potatoes. I found quite a few ruined ones, and so I've, I'm discarding those, taking those to the amenity site, and I'm going to keep a close eye on all of these potatoes as well, because once you have some blighted potatoes in your storage, it can spread to your other potatoes, and you can lose a lot that way. The pumpkin patch this year is absolutely epic. There are, I think, eight plants in here, all different varieties of pumpkins. Let's see if we can find some of the squash. Oh yes, there's one right there. And then we've got a massive one here. I can't remember what this one is called. And then there's another green one back behind there. Oh, and another one right there. Oh my goodness. And then that one is definitely a Turk's turban and it's a good size, that one. I have no idea what's in the middle. I'll find out at the end of the year, I think. And then this one up here, this one is a Queensland blue and it's really good flesh, good storage pumpkin or winter squash. I can't really wade into the center of here to know if there's any more, but I'm sure there are tons underneath all of these leaves. The no dig asparagus is doing great. I have each plant staked, so it's got lots of supports there with string and with wooden stakes in the ground. Really necessary for my garden because it is quite windy here. I've also found that because I'm on a slope, the compost around the roots does erode a bit quicker, so I have to keep pulling it back. But other than that, they look healthy and some of the stems are quite thick, so who knows? Maybe I'll be able to get a harvest next year. As for the cucumber pellet trellis, it seems to be doing its job and Maggie is quite fond of jumping up on it, as you can see, kind of surveying the garden. There are two different types of gherkins growing on the trellis and they are sprawling a little bit on the ground, which is perfectly fine. The face of the palette gives them a little bit more space to grow up and get a bit more light. And let's see if we can find some gherkins. Oh yes, there's a quite large one right there. And I did spot some over on this side as well. So you can see there and there. I need to come out here and get picking. There are quite a few trees in the garden. Most of them are either hedgerow trees or fruit trees, and this is no different. This is a Victoria plum tree, and if you've noticed it in the background of my videos or pictures on social media, it got quite big, and it was, or it could have been very prolific with plums this year. We got a good few, maybe a bowl full, but unfortunately, this tree is infected with something called plum pocket. It's a fungal disease, and it lodges into the bark, it lodges into the fruit, and then it proliferates from year to year and it causes really horrible deformed fruit. I first noticed the plum pocket the year we moved into the house, so that's 2021. And I had to do some online searching because I'd never ever seen it before. And because it devastates the crop, I knew I had to do something about it. The tree could live, but it could also spread those spores to all the sloes in our hedgerow, to any of the plum trees that are in the neighborhood. And what I've done thus far is try to remove all the fruit. I did that last year, and I've also given it a light prune. Neither of those worked. And so my tactic now is to get it to a size where I can reach all of the branches, and that's what I've done. I have effectively butchered this tree. I've taken it down by half and I was very nervous doing it. Now is the time to do it. You only prune plums in summertime. Winter is very dangerous to, to do that. 
And as you can see, there's a big pile of branches over there. We're gonna take those to the amenity site, so the green waste bin there, not keep them in the garden, because again, that fungus can still live in the bark. And then I'm going to let this tree recover, going to let it sit out the winter, and then next year, right at the end of winter, early spring, I'm going to use a, a copper-based fungicide that is used with peach leaf curl. And it supposedly it will help to nip this other fungus, plum pocket, in the bud. So fingers crossed, I will let you know how it goes. And if you have plum pocket and have dealt with it successfully or you've not dealt with it successfully, leave me a comment down below because I'm really curious to know what your experience has been as well. video I shared how I made this driftwood trellis and it looks stunning it's really worked out although I will have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed with the Malabar spinach they haven't grown nearly as much outdoors as they have in the polycrop and then over here the birdies beds they've been brilliant this year with being just a really convenient place to grow greens and I also had this bed here in the front filled with calendula this year. And a couple of days ago, I made the executive decision to take it out. It was looking a little bit worse for wear. I collected the seeds. I collected the last of the flowers, pulled all the plants out, and then added a little bit of cocoa core. It needed a little bit more structure, I think. It's pure compost in, the, in this particular bed. And then I've got it raked out. We're gonna come back to this a little bit later and get it planted up with a few more seedlings. And then back here to the polycrub and the little pond. I'm not sure if I shared an update last time on the pond. It is absolutely brilliant. And I love, absolutely love just sitting here. The two pots here at the end, these are watercress that I'm growing in terracotta pots. So just like the Oyas that are made out of terracotta, these pots will absorb water and they love sitting in moist soil, so they're doing all right. Although the one that's actually, the plants that are growing around the Oya over in the birdies bed seem to be doing a little bit better. And I've also put sea glass here so that bees can stop and land on the little pieces and get a little drink of water. This time last year, the polycrub was heaving with tomatoes that needed picking and cucumbers and everything. This year it's a little bit different in that everything is so late. The tomatoes have really just started ripening in the past week or so. There are a fair few in here that need picking. They're just down in the middle bed this year because last year there were just so many I thought I would restrict their numbers this year. I wish I'd planted a little bit more but they have been delicious the ones that we've been picking and as you can see we've got a few more to enjoy. I've gone ahead and not only harvested the peppers, which you see are actually turning a bit red on the top, good sized peppers, but also all of the ripe tomatoes. And there's a good fair few in there, including this beauty. But if you are like me, you will have loads of green tomatoes and it's getting a little bit late in the season. So how can we help speed up the ripening of green tomatoes. And there's a few things that we can do. The first thing is to cut off the growing tip. So the very tops of indeterminate tomato plants will continue to grow upwards as long as we allow them to grow. But by cutting them off at the top, the plant then kind of redirects its energy more towards what's below that point. Sometimes it will send out side shoots to grow out and up as well. So we need to cut those as well. Now, as far as foliage is concerned, we do need to remove as much as possible so that the plant, again, isn't directing its energy towards growing leaves and supporting those leaves, but rather the fruit. And so remove all of the leaves 
up to the very first truss of tomatoes. And if you do that, then that not, not only opens up the plant, but it reduces the amount of leaves that the plant has to support. And while you're at it, remove any of the leaves that are around the fruit because sunlight can help fruit to ripen and opening that up encourages the ripening. Now, the last thing is removing any flowers. And I can see there's some flowers way up here. And if tomato plants this late in the game have tomato flowers on them, they're not ever going to turn into fruit, but will actually be a diversion for the plants. So remove any of the flowers that you see and also any of the extra foliage that's up here alongside them. So the side shoots and again, any leaves that are covering fruit a little bit further up on the plants as well. tree spinach is still going strong and I included this green in my roundup of easy crops to grow that are pretty much fail safe. You can watch that video if you haven't seen it already and we are using this as a spinach replacement. It is incredibly delicious, incredibly easy to grow especially undercover but also outdoors and I have heard from a couple of people saying that their tree spinach doesn't grow as tall. This is a variety called magenta spreen and I would highly, highly recommend it. You might have seen on social media just a, a week ago or so that the melon plant on the right hand side had fallen down. Basically, the string had rotted in the ground and somehow the plant just slid down and kind of lost its footing. I was able to save it, thank goodness, and it has a fair few number of melons on it. This is a variety called Petit Gris de Rennes, kind of a cantaloupe style melon. And this one over here, there's plenty more melons as well. And how do you know when melons are ripe and ready to pick? You cannot mistake it because they go from smelling like nothing to smelling like intense melon. And then that's when you pick. I think that I've started a tradition that this far bed is just always going to be a jungle. Last year it was butternut squash and tomatoes. This year, most of the foliage here on the far end is sweet potato. And you can see it more closely up here and it's climbing in the back, it's sprawling all over the place, down here in the front, and then tucked in here, there's also some peppers. We've got some padrones here, which are ideal, picked quite small. If you uh, wait till they're about this size, they can get quite spicy, as I found out last year. But if you pick them, I guess about this size and smaller, they're mainly just mild, sweet, delicious peppers. On the other side here, we've got paprika peppers because I'm going to be growing peppers and making paprika spice this year. This one is a sweet paprika pepper and you can see one of them has already turned red. And then I've got two hot wax peppers over here as well. And I got this, these two plants from uh, Rudmai Chili Farm earlier on in the year and they are absolutely prolific. Over here is my row of aubergines, eggplants, and they are just now starting to form fruit. You can see there's one in there, and I have seen some little ones. Oh yes, you can see these ones are long and thin. They're called violet nights. And I'm gonna have to support these plants, I think. So run string from the bamboo down here because as these fruits are getting bigger they're going to weigh down the plants. The carrots have been fantastic and the veggie pod this year and we've just been going in here and harvesting as we need carrots and the climate here is mild enough that I can leave root crops in the ground until we need to harvest them and you can see a big chunky carrot there. Oh wow look at how big that one is. It's got a little kind of divot in it, but that's fine. No carrot root fly, which is really important. And the entire point of growing carrots in the veggie pod, growing them in an elevated space, oops, pull this out, 
Growing them in an elevated space just keeps them away from the flight path of carrot root flies. Though the greenhouse isn't as full as it was earlier on this year, there's a few things of interest in here. Now, first of all, do you remember the onions that I brought in here to dry off? Well, most of them are downstairs now. I left them in here to dry out completely and I put them down there for storage. These few I've just left in here so that I don't have far to go from the kitchen to get a few onions. Now these are the calendula seeds that I collected from the calendula plants in the birdie bed and they are resina. So I'm drying these out for future sowings if I'd like to. And my goodness, there were only, I think, a handful of seeds in the seed packet and look how many I was able to gather from the plants. There's also seedlings in here. Some of them, like the Swedes back here, I'm going to plant up in the birdies bed today. And then I've got lots of cabbages. These are going down where the potatoes were. And so I'll put some netting down there and get those planted out probably in the next two, three weeks. And then more cucumbers over here. So in the pallet planter, I've got three cucumber plants and these are mainly gherkins. You can see one here. This one's a little bit too big, but we'll probably find some use for it. And even down here on the floor. So they're doing really well. There's another one hiding there, another two. My goodness, so many gherkins and cucumbers this year, just like last. And that was a quite a good way of growing them, just upstring and then kind of training them along the edge of the greenhouse there. Unlike the potatoes that were out in the garden, this one that I planted in the trug earlier in the spring is still growing, green leaves and all. It's just much more protected in here and the plant has been protected from blight, from cold weather. And at the weigh-in next month, if there's not a decent amount of potatoes in here, I will be really, really disappointed. Now, as far as seeds to sow right now though, I'm not planning on sowing very many. Some more lettuce. I've got winter density on the go already, but I'll sow some more of it for over the winter. Salad rocket is another one. So basically quick growing greens. I've just done a couple of rows of spinach. It's another one. But I do have some seedlings here that I sowed about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. There's some Swedes here, one lone kohlrabi that popped up and a bit of beetroot. And so I'm gonna put them here in this birdie's bed and hopefully there's enough time to get a bit of a harvest before it starts getting cold. <laughs> You little devil. Hey, Maggie. As far as other gardening tasks for August, it's really about harvesting. So keeping on top of harvesting and also keeping on top of watering, especially if you're growing undercover in greenhouses or polytunnels. If you keep on top of watering, that will keep your plants being productive and you'll start reaping in even more harvest through the end of this month and into September. There's also some things that you can prune this month as well. So you can prune your lavender. You can, of course, prune your stone fruits like plums and apricots, uh, peaches and cherries. And if you do want to prune other crops like apples and pears, when you prune in summer, it's mainly about stopping growth. When you prune in winter, it helps to encourage growth. So think about those kinds of things. And I will be pruning the side shoots of my minaret apple and pear trees this month as well. And that will help to keep them in that column shape. So there are a few things to do this month, but it's really just about enjoying being outside. We're down to our last few weeks of summer, really. and getting on top of our summer gardens but if you are interested in even more garden jobs and things that will keep you busy in the garden for this month and also in september you can watch my video september garden jobs next thanks so much for watching and i'll see you next time here on love the greens bye for now